O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth shall declare your grace. Hasten to save me, O God. The Lord be with you. We pray. Lord God, you have brought us safely to this hour of evening prayer. We thank you for providing all that we need for body and life. Bless us who have gathered in your name. Forgive our sins. Speak to our hearts. Dispel our sorrows with the comfort of your word and receive our hymns of thanks and praise. Through Jesus Christ, our living Savior, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord our God, you did not forget the pierced body of your Son, and his sighing was not hidden from you. In your kindness, look also on us, your children, weighed down with sins, and grant us the fullness of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. The portion of the Passion History this evening is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, beginning at verse 57. If you'd like, you can follow along in the insert in your service folders. Those who had arrested Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the experts in the law and the elders were assembled. Peter was following him at a distance and went as far as the courtyard of the high priest. He went inside and sat down with the guards to see how it would turn out. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they could put him to death. They found none, even though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. The high priest stood up and said to him, Have you no answer? What is this that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus remained silent. Then the high priest said to him, I place you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you have said. But I tell you, soon you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? See, you have just heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered, He is deserving of death. Then they spit in his face and punched him. Some slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? Meanwhile... Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, You were also with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it in front of everyone, saying, I don't know what you're talking about. When Peter went out to the entryway, someone else saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it with an oath and said, I do not know the man. After a little while, those who stood by came and said to Peter, Surely you are also one of them, because even your accent gives you away. Then he began to curse and to swear, I do not know the man. Just then the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. This is God's word. We join in the seasonal response together. All we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds we are healed. Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God our Heavenly Father, through his Son and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text this evening is a portion of Jesus' seven words on the cross. This is the first seven, first of the seven words recorded in Luke chapter 23, beginning at verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. This is God's word. May we always learn from that word of God. Dear brothers and dear sisters, in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, <clears throat> one thing that you can certainly count on in this life is change in all different sorts of ways. There are the life changes that person goes through in life you're born into this world <clears throat> as an infant 
you depend on your parents for absolutely everything. You go to the toddler stage, to the child stage, to the teenage stage, ever gaining more and more independence. Adult stage, finally you're independent. And you're probably having some dependence of your own. You get to the middle age stage of your life. You get to the retirement age of life. And then you get to the point where you're actually dependent on people just like you were years and years ago, if God allows you to last on this earth that long. There are the work changes that people go through. Not very often that one person keeps the same job throughout his or her lifetime. There are the other changes. You might change your hairstyle depending on the year or the decade. You might change your clothes styles because clothing styles change or waistlines change once in a while. You've got all kinds of other changes. Technology, it's always a step or two ahead of us. You buy a phone, it's obsolete in the next week or two. You buy a computer, there's always something out there that's faster and better and more powerful. You're always chasing the technology changes in this world. Even, even churches have their, their share of changes. I mentioned this past Sunday about the difference between the hymnals from pre-1941 to 1941 to 1993 and then the one that we've got right now, Christian worship. Does anybody remember a time <clears throat> pre-1993 when there were really only two choices which service you're going to use? If it was a communion Sunday, you use page 15. If it was not a communion Sunday, you use page 5. Once in a while, a great while, you would use matins or vespers, but for the most part, there were only two choices in the hymnal. Jesus, as well, went through the stages of life. He went through the same life changes as any human being would because he was a true man. His residence changed. He was born in Bethlehem. He moved back to Nazareth where he spent most of his growing up years. When he started his ministry, in the middle of those three years, he changed his residence to a town called Capernaum. Three residence changes in his short life. His occupation changed. He started out as a, a, a carpenter in the city of Nazareth, the town of Nazareth, and then eventually moved to a, a teacher, preacher, rabbi, well-respected rabbi that preached and taught with authority. But all of those were just outward, external changes. Because what does the Bible tell us about Jesus? In the book of Hebrews, the writer to the Hebrews says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and always. Jesus really never changes because he's true God. He is unchanging in his very essence, which is a tremendous comfort when it comes to dealing with what we have to deal with in life. And that is specifically our sins. Because you and I, we might change from day to day. You might be forgiving to your child one day, but not so forgiving to your child the next day, if you've had a bad day at work or a bad day for some other reason. You might be forgiven pretty easily for something, but not forgiven so easily for another thing. Not so with Jesus. Always the same. Always forgiving, always merciful, always gracious, always compassionate, always has forgiveness as his goal in his life. And, and, and that remains constant with him. Even as he was crucified on the cross, forgiveness was on his mind, which is what we're going to see this, this evening. St. Luke, he doesn't spend a whole lot of time describing Jesus' crucifixion. Just a couple of words in our text. They crucified him there. When they came to the place of the skull, they crucified him there. The Apostles' Creed, just a couple of words, was crucified. That's how they sum up that terrible day on Good Friday when Jesus spent most of that day on that cross. With that short sentence, however, <clears throat> there's all kinds of meaning packed into it. Because with those words, Jesus was crucified there. We see that the king of all creation, the one through whom all creation was formed and came into being, he humbled himself 
to be born of a virgin, live in this earth, and die a criminal's death. The Lord of lords and the King of kings gave up the, the, the throne of heaven and came down and humiliated himself to be beaten and bloodied and hang there naked until he died on the cross on Good Friday between two people who really were criminals. There they crucified him. They crucified him there. It seems with those words that everything has changed for Jesus, doesn't it? But yet, with Jesus, remember, nothing changes. Because what were the first words that came out of his mouth when he stood there, when he hung there on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing you know, usually that was not what the criminals would do when they were being crucified by the Roman soldiers. Usually, historians say that they did what? They swore up and down and they cursed a blue streak until they finally got to the point where they begged and pleaded for their lives. That's a typical criminal execution in Roman times. But not Jesus. Never cursed, never swore. He never begged for his life or begged for mercy, but what he did do was ask for forgiveness, not for himself, but for people around him. Jesus' grace never changes. He's always, always got forgiveness on his mind, even as the spikes were being driven through his hands and his feet. Father, forgive them. That fact should not, should not surprise us one bit because that's who Jesus was. That's what his business was. Do you remember the paralyzed man in Capernaum? His friends came because they knew Jesus was going to be in a certain house. They got the man. They lowered him down through the thatched roof of a house. And Jesus, first of all, what did he do? He made his legs work again. But then he says, your sins are forgiven. Full and complete when, when, when Jesus taught his disciples and we teach our children and our grandchildren the Lord's Prayer, what is that petition that comes after the earthly petition? Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Fast forward past Jesus' resurrection and right before he ascended into heaven and he told his disciples... He predicted that this is what was going to happen. He says, Repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. It was his mission. And it's what he commissions us to do in our lives as Christians as well. We announce the forgiveness that Jesus won for us on the cross. We share that forgiveness for anybody who does not know it. It's not surprising that Jesus started off his time on the cross with words of forgiveness. But what is surprising is who he was speaking them to. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. So who is the them that Jesus was speaking about? Father, forgive them. What, was it just the, the Roman Soldiers who were just doing their job, they were just following orders. Was that who Jesus was speaking to? I know that I've preached many sermons, especially during Lent, that talk as if that was the group of people that Jesus was speaking to. He must have been speaking to the soldiers because they had just finished driving those nails through his hands and feet and they had just finished lifting him up on that cross on Calvary. Was that the only group of people that he was speaking to? Give them, for they do not know what they are doing. Them is more than just the Roman soldiers. What about the people, the teachers of the law that we talked about earlier in the Passion history that plotted and planned his execution? Did they need forgiveness? What about Pontius Pilate, who was in the city of Jerusalem, not too far away from where Jesus was being crucified, and he was desperately trying to wash his hands of the guilt that he felt? Because he knew very well in the heart of his hearts that Jesus was not guilty. What about him? Didn't he need forgiveness as well? What about the people, <clears throat> teachers, their henchmen that spit on him and beat him and mocked him and fashioned a crude cross or crude crown and pressed it on his head and then dressed him in a, a mocking purple robe? What about them? Didn't they deserve 
Jesus' words of forgiveness, they needed them desperately. What about all the people in Jerusalem that had not too many days before this said, yes, he's our king, Hosanna, he's the son of David. But now they said, crucify him, ever louder and ever more screaming, crucify him, crucify him. All deserved Jesus' words of forgiveness. All needed Jesus' words of forgiveness. Because in short, who was Jesus talking about when he said them? Father, forgive them. He was saying this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. God loves the world. And so Jesus was naturally saying, Father, forgive them, the whole world. Now, now we might say to that, we might reply to that, of course God loves the world because he loves all God-fearing, God-pleasing people who came out on a Wednesday night to sit in the pews to listen to a Lenten service and be a part of a Lenten service. God, of course, loves the people that are here this evening. But that's not what he said. Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So who is the world that Jesus said God so loved? Here, here's some recent headlines that describe the world that God so loved. Four arrested after kidnapping and beating a mentally disabled man. Gunmen disguised as doctors attack military hospital in Afghanistan. More than 30 killed. Gang of middle school students assault girl and record their attack on video. Elderly man scammed out of $400,000 by fake IRS agent. Four dead, at least 20 injured in terrorist attack on West Westminster Bridge in London today. That's the world that God loved. That's the world that Jesus was speaking of when he said, For God so loved the world, even the terrorists and the rapists and the murderers and those who assault and the drug pushers and the white-collar criminals, God loves them, even, yes, them. But, but here's the thing. They're not sitting here tonight. You're sitting in the pews, and I'm standing in the pulpit. Who does God love God loves us too. Because we are in so much desperate need of God's forgiveness just as much as anybody else in this world. Why? <clears throat> because of the times that you might not have done something like this, but maybe something similar. We sing Amazing Grace in church and we sing it lustily with all of our hearts. And then we walk out of church and we trash our neighbors in conversations at home. Or we talk about the people in not so glowing terms when they cut us off in the car on the highway. We pray fervently, God, please help those less fortunate than me. But we refuse to be the tool through which God helps those people because we've got other things to do, better priorities in our life. We can recite the first commandment easily. You shall have no other gods. But we run from one God to the next God to the next God constantly in our lives. Poor priorities the whole time. This is me that God loves? God loves even me. The, the night before Jesus died, he told his disciples, <clears throat> greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Greater love had no one than Jesus because he laid down his life for his friends. Yes, even the drug pushers and the terrorists and the murderers. How can they be friends? Because Christ died to make them friends. We who were once enemies with God, Christ died to make us friends with him again. We who were once only sinners, God now is giving us the status of saints because of Christ's death. That's what Jesus' death does. That's what his word of forgiveness does. One of my favorite hymns is, is 391. We sang it a couple of Sundays ago here at Zion. Jesus, your blood, Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, thy beauty are my glorious dress. This, this is the last verse of that hymn. Be of good cheer, for God's own Son forgives the sins that you have done. You're justified by Jesus' blood, baptized, you are a child of God. 
there is no sin that you commit that is not covered by Jesus' blood. There is no shame of your youth or no embarrassment or no sin of your youth that Jesus has not forgiven on Calvary's cross. There is no sin that we can commit in the future that God says, nope, not that one. I've, I've forgiven you a lot, but not that one. I can't forgive you that particular sin. Jesus' death and his resurrection and the forgiveness that comes through those life events of Jesus are the foundation that we base our forgiveness and our peace and our hope of heaven on. What Jesus did on the cross here. Th this is the truth that empowers us to be Christians and to live as Christians and to live as repentant Christians, not ever turning to ourselves because we think that we can be good enough to make up for the times that we are bad enough. Not to be like Judas who, who said, I can't be forgiven, so I, he despaired to the point of killing himself. No, we don't turn to ourselves, nor do we despair of ourselves. We simply turn to Jesus and only Jesus because he alone can forgive our sins. Did you catch the very beginning of our text? <clears throat> In Luke chapter 23, verses 33, it says, Where, When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. I don't know that there is any significance that we can attach to that, but it's kind of neat to see that Jesus was crucified right in the middle because that's really where Jesus was. In catechism class, we talk about the fact that Jesus was the mediator between God and man. Jesus is the one that was lifted up on earth to be that middle man between heaven and earth and God and sinners because he was the only one that could take care of our sins once and for all. He is the toning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Many, many, many things in this world change. Not everything, but many things. Most things change in this world. But there are a lot of things that also stay the same. <clears throat> Thank God that Jesus' essence falls into that latter category. Jesus stays the same. This Lent, turn in faith to Jesus, because he longs, he longs to forgive you. Amen. The peace of God, which goes beyond our understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Gracious Father, continue to bless our journey this Lenten season as we follow Jesus to the cross and the empty tomb. Grant us a rich prayer life that we may daily come before you with our petitions confess our sins to you, and trust in your mercy. Give us steadfast hearts to believe that our prayers are righteous and effective and are heard for the sake of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Welcome to all who have gathered together on this fourth midweek Lenten service. Um, opportunity. Two more on, on the next two Wednesdays. Next week, Pastor Billy Carter from Brownsville will be here. Um, the, the, the service theme is in your, in your folder, but the main focus for this whole Lenten service is, is repentance, which causes us to turn to Jesus, which is a perfect theme, not just for, for a Lenten service, but for um, what the Bible really says. We turn to Jesus because he is the source and the author of our, our forgiveness. The, uh, <clears throat> the, there are no other announcements. Um, I wish you God's blessings as you continue your Lenten journey to the cross.